The secret language of emotion. And I think she'll be selling, uh, have some of those available after the service. So please help me welcome Kat Thompson. <clears throat> Thank you, Ella. It's great to be back here, even though it's a very snowy morning. I thank you all for, you know, getting out there in this blizzardy morning and, and making your way here. It's always a, a joy to be here and to be in this group energy that happens in the Lake Harriet spiritual community. So um, those of you who have seen me speak before know a lot about my story. Those of you who haven't, um, you can go to my website, which is emotionaltechnologies.com, and a lot of my story is on there. But basically, I grew up as one of those really sickly children, and so I, because I was unable to participate physically in my outer world, I spent went deep and deep and deep into my inner world. And I was fascinated and, and addicted to knowledge. I wanted to know everything about everything. And so that was the driving force of my life was I, I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand what it meant to be human. I wanted to understand why things were the way they were. Why, were, why was the world the way that it was? Why did people act the way that they did? How did... I remember the question <clears throat> that plagued me the most in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep and I couldn't breathe. I had to sit up all night and rock because I couldn't lay down and breathe. And I would look at my sister, we shared a bed, and I would think, why does she get that body and I got this body? Like, what made that determination? And that question really drove me for years to understand. And then <clears throat> when I was 24, I had a hysterectomy due to a very lazy, arrogant doctor. And I decided that I was gonna make the cost of my uterus the price I was gonna pay to take charge of my own health. So I began to study herbology, I began to study nutrition, I began to study how the body works, and I was amazed at how ignorant I was at how my body worked. I had no idea what happened from the time I ate something until it came out the other end. I didn't know. And so finding that out, like really exploring like what happens when energy comes into your body and how does it get dispersed and where does it get blocked and, you know, and then finding out all these correlations so then I was in the film business for 20 years and I really loved it for, you know, for almost the entire 20 years and then I just hit that roadblock where I was burnt out and I was done. And I was like, what am I gonna do now? Who's gonna pay me money? I don't have any training in anything else. So I had been working with this woman uh, during my final film, Grumpy Old Men was my last film I worked on. And I'd been working with this woman who had developed this really amazing uh, therapy. And so I said, would you, would you take me on as a student? And she said, of course. So I spent three years training with her, and I stayed in the business doing commercials to pay for that. And then I started seeing clients and started my own practice. And, you know, I was terrified at the time. Like, I don't know anything about this. I'm just making it up as I go. Um, and then I learned how to work with nature intelligences. And when I began to understand how to connect with nature intelligences and invite them in to healing sessions and partner with me. All of the stress about being a, about seeing clients was just gone because I don't do it by myself. I listen. And the topic today is empathy. And empathy has everything to do with the ability to deeply listen. And I'll get more into detail about that later. But anyway, so then, I left the film business, I moved to Mexico for five years and just kind of settled out, wrote the first draft of my book, um, kind of healed my heart, and then I came back and, and started my practice. And it has been a really interesting journey. Um, I remember distinctly when I moved from thinking like a victim to thinking like a creator. And that was the big change in my life, I think, was understanding co-creation, that everything that happened to me in my experience was co-created. And I, when I first heard that, there was a resistance like, no, I couldn't be, no, why would I do that? Why would, I'm not responsible for that. 
But there was another part of me that was so excited, like, wow, if I am a co-creator, that means I have some power to actually create a reality that I would love to live in. So I moved in that direction, and of course, the shadows come up all the time and say like, hello, <laughs> here I am, let's do some work over here. So empathy. Let's talk about the difference between sympathy and empathy. In the, uh, I think, is it Greek? The prefix, sis, so sympathy, means with. So when you feel sympathy for somebody, you're with their feelings, you're with them, you can kind of relate and, and be there, right? You're with them. But empathy, the prefix of empathy means inside. So when you're empathetic with somebody, you actually are them. Now, that is a terrifying thing for those of us who, those of us who have been brought up in a culture that reveres individuality. We revere, you know, the lone ranger, the cowboy. Like, we have this idea, I'm doing it myself. I can make it. I don't need anybody else, right? That is the opposite direction of empathy. Yes, we all do many things by ourselves, but we don't ever do them completely by ourselves because we have been, there's a support system that got put in place before we ever stepped foot in a direction, right? And then there's tons of support along the way that we may not even be aware of that will help us to get to where we are. So this idea of rugged individuality I think has to, it's time for us to change that. It's time for us to move into, we are all the same intelligence. We are, we are the intelligence of the universe simply expressing itself in many different ways. And my favorite part of that is if you are a good, empathetic listener, how many people here have ever been at a dinner party with a bunch of really interesting people and they, somebody starts telling a story and you forget everything? You're not thinking of the story in your head that you're going to tell when they're done. You know, you're not getting triggered by something in their story, but you're just fascinated by what they're saying and you're completely focused on it and you can feel. You can feel the part of the story where it's like, oh, <gasps> You can feel the part of the story where the tears come or the joy or the amazement, right? How many people have had that experience? That's empathy. Because not only are you inside that person and you're able to feel that, but you now have a story that you didn't have to live yourself, but it's part of you. Your body recognizes that story now as your own experience. This is, to me, one of the most magical things about the emotional body ever, is that if I'm a good listener and I'm in an empathetic state and you tell me a story that I find really, that, that, that is so juicy and interesting that I am just riveted to it, my body now thinks that I've lived that story, or not thinks that. It knows the story inside out because I just lived it through the telling of it. And it's why we all have to get better at telling stories. Because we want to be able to share with people all the juicy nuances of the story. Not just the highlights, you know, or not just the bad parts, but the whole story so that we can get the whole thing. I always get so dry in here. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got to empathy. When I was in my 20s, I discovered that I had this ability to manipulate my environment so that people played supporting roles in my story. I would fantasize about certain stories that excited me. And they always included people that I had met or people that I knew, right? And so I would fantasize, I would write their role. And then it would happen exactly as I had fantasized it because I put a tremendous amount of emotional energy into it. Emotion has always been my strong, my strong suit. 
So I would put all of this energy into um, writing this story and getting them to play a key role. And most people went along with it because my stories were fun and they were exciting and they were dramatic, but they weren't sustainable. And I didn't want them to be sustainable. It was just like a, a brief moment in the story and then I would move on. I'd have stories going over here and stories going. And so people who wanted to have ongoing stories with me would get frustrated because I'd be like, no, I'm not really. In and I, we never talked about it because there wasn't really a language, but it would be then these relationships would blow up. And so then I was like, well, relationships are bad. You know, <laughs> it's best to just keep a distance. But eventually, or actually not very far into that, I realized that I had this power and I was misusing it. And that I didn't understand it well enough to really be um, ethical with it. And so then I, I, drew, I drew back, I stopped trying to manipulate people and, and into my stories and started trying to understand the power of creating story and being able to manipulate people. Like, what is that about? Where did that come from? How, how would that be ethical? How would that be a spiritual you know, tool? So that began my journey that ha it continues on to this day. I continue to look at ways that um, knowing what I know about the ability to manipulate my reality, I have to stay constantly focused on the, ethica the ethical part of it and am I doing it out of reaction or am I doing it out of uh, creation? So that's how I started my journey to sympathy or to empathy. Um, I wanted to uh, read this quote, which I think is on your handout. And so if somebody could help me with his name, because I've never said it out loud, I've only watched, I've only seen it. Uh, it's at the, should be at the bottom of your page, it's the quote. Tick, not, Tick not Han, Tick not Han. Okay, the situation of the world is like this. People completely identify with one side, one ideology. To understand the suffering and the fear of a human being who thinks differently, we have to become one with him or her. To do so is dangerous. We will be suspected by both sides. But if we don't do it, if we align ourselves with one side or the other, we will lose our chance to work for peace. Reconciliation is to understand both sides. Now we all know that intellectually, but how many of us know that viscerally? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my experience in the last two years with, with this idea. <clears throat> it started with the 2020 election. And I'd always considered myself progressive, a Democrat, you know, somebody who cared about other people and cared about social, um, social issues and environmental issues, you know, that, that was my identity. And I was invited to join a group of women business owners, and I did. And it turned out that the majority of them were all Republicans, and they were voting for Trump for in that election. And instead of being triggered by that and saying, you know, this isn't really my tribe, or I don't really, you know, blah, 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 the little, whatever little story I would tell myself in the past, I said, you know what, I, I choose to understand. So I began to have these conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations with these women. And I didn't ask them like, why are you voting for him? You know, that, didn't, that was a s silly question. What I really wanted to know was, what's your perspective of the world that causes you to say or write this particular thing? And as I began to have these conversations, I had sort of an awakening, and I realized that I had become so polarized in my identity politically that I was resistant to opening to the possibility that I might be wrong about something or that there might be a different story. And I'm a storyteller. I am very much attracted to telling stories and hearing stories. And I have always, and I think that we all do this. We tell ourselves the stories that justify our experiences. 
We tell ourselves the story that justifies our actions. We tell ourselves the stories that make us right. And you know what? Sometimes those stories, it's not that the story is right or wrong. It's that if you're creating your own reality, then those stories that you're telling yourself will actually create the environment that you're telling yourself about. So if you're telling yourself that you have been victimized in some way, you're gonna continue to create a victimizing a reality around you, and you will continue to be victimized. And I am an expert in this field, I can tell you. I did not wanna give up being a victim. I had one of those childhoods that if I told you about it, I would have you all in tears in five minutes. And I'm not going to do that because that would feed into the energy of I was victimized. As a co-creator, I have never been victimized. It's just that I didn't understand how I was creating things when I was young. Now I do understand, so I have the option of having, I love do-overs. Do-overs are when you have <clears throat> an experience from your past repeat itself, but you have a different situation, it's usually different people. Sometimes it's the same person, but it can, usually it's different people. And um, you have the opportunity and the tools to go through it differently and change the ending, right? So you can, you can have a do-over of a victim situation that never got resolved for you, and you can do it over and come out as a creator. And so that's what I was seeking with this group of women, I was seeking to find a place where we could come together that we agreed on, that was compassionate, that was respectful, and that nobody was wrong. And in the process of that, I lost about 90% of my community. Because the fact that I was having these conversations and then I happened to mention it, and people went crazy. My life blew up. They were screaming at me, calling me names. Oh, now you're a Trumper. <clears throat> and I was like, wow, what's happening here? And then I saw the polarity manipulation that was happening in the media and how there's such a strong drive to keep us separated, to keep us angry with each other, to keep us polarized. So I was like, you know what? <clears throat> I'm gonna only hang out with people who don't talk in polarity anymore, who really talk in the terms of unity, right? So I kind of cleared out my, I went through my, my friend book, as it were, and about 98% of them were all gone at that point. And the, so it was kind of lonely. 2020 was really lonely for me. 2020 and 2021 were kind of lonely for me. But there was this, also there was this expectancy. There was like this pregnant pause where I knew something cool was coming in. And so it's like, all right, 2020 was my year of grief. Grief is, is essential for change. Grief always comes before change, and it is essential for change because what grief does is that it allows the old belief systems to wash out, and it creates space for new belief systems to come in, or new experiences to come in. So grief is essential. We've got to learn to be really good at grieving. I was, uh, I'm in this watercolor painting group, and I was talking about how you know I set these... Um, rules for myself sometimes, like, okay, today you're only gonna paint with one color and you're not gonna draw any lines. And I go, and then I sob through the entire day <laughs> because it pushes me into such a place of discomfort and then it brings up all these emotions and this woman's like, well, you shouldn't cry. And I was like, oh boy, <laughs> I'm the queen of crying. Um, so I'm not afraid of grieving. I, in fact, I embrace it. I was just thinking yesterday, like, I haven't cried for a really long time. It might be time to start watching rescue videos. I love watching rescue videos because it makes me cry, you know? And uh, whether it's dogs or, you know, cats or whatever it is. Uh, and it, that crying really moves things through. And I find that when I don't allow myself to grieve when I'm feeling like it, I always get sick. I always get a cold. Because colds, which are coronaviruses, 
are genetic upgrades. And when I'm not grieving, I'm not making room for a genetic upgrade that's coming through the environment. So then I'll get a cold, which forces me to go quiet, <clears throat> sit still, you know, be in a state of receptivity, and then the upgrade can happen without me being busy. Does that make sense? And if you have questions at all, raise your hand while I'm talking. I love questions. Sometimes I'll call on people randomly just because I want somebody to answer something. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, uh, wait. Um, she's got the microphone. So because we're live streaming, it's important that we use the microphone. So if you'll just wait one moment. On. Um, yeah, the question is, you say grief always comes before change. Is there any other precipice or any other things that you would say um, are very strong like um, indicators of change coming, like besides just grief? Because grief is obviously one, but like what other things would you say keep on the lookout for for change? What an excellent question. Thank you. <clears throat> um, in my book, in my work, The Five Elements, Fear governs change. So fear falls under the, uh, or change falls under the emotion of fear. There's five master emotions. Grief, fear, anger, joy, and sympathy is what the five element, um, traditional five element system, but I've upgraded mine to empathy because I think we do need an upgrade to empathy. So fear governs change, and that's why when we don't know what's gonna happen, our first reaction is gonna be fear, right? And that's why I handed out that worksheet. I gave everybody a worksheet. It's a great way to get really clear about something. So if you are feeling fear about something or feeling upset, like, oh my God, I don't know what's gonna happen. Like, is the economy gonna crash? How will I eat? Will I be living in my car? You know, blah, blah, blah. These are all very valid things to be thinking right now because the stories we're being told are stories of, of scarcity, of polarity, of hatred, of meanness, right? So there's this energy around us that is actively working to keep us in fear because if we are in fear, it's very difficult for us to be in our heart and if we're not in our heart, we can't be in compassion or empathy. So when you feel fear, the first thing to do, fear lives here. Okay, fear lives here. You can't do anything here. This is all very vague and very, there's no real, you can't really grab onto that and do something about it, right? However, an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper is a structure, it's a very finite structure, right? So I made this worksheet, it's like, what am I upset about? I'm upset about because what if I lose everything? And you don't have to write more than, that. you just have to write a quick sentence about what you're feeling, and then you just go to your emotions and you say, what is my fear saying? And I did this exercise this morning when I got up because I have been, sometimes I get really nervous about coming here and speaking. And so I was like, what is my fear saying? My fear is saying, I'm, I'm gonna fail, I'm gonna forget everything that I'm supposed to say, it's not gonna go the way I want it to go, I'll be a failure, blah, 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 you know? And then what does my grief say and what does my anger say? My anger said, why did you have to snow? <laughs> And I got to the end of the page and it's like, whew, I was done, right? I felt good. When I moved to Mexico, I didn't speak Spanish or read the road signs. And so I drove my three and a half days to Texas and the night before I crossed the border, I got my notebook out and I wrote and wrote and wrote and my fears were overwhelming. And it's like, I'm driving a Honda. There's no Honda dealers in Mexico. What if I have a breakdown? What will happen? What if a truck hits me and I don't have a car? I'm in the middle of Mexico. I have nowhere to go and I don't have a car and I won't be able to buy another car. I mean, like every single possible thing I could think of, I wrote and wrote for hours. And I got up the next morning and I was like completely free of anything except joy. And I got in my car and I crossed that border and it was just like my whole heart expanded because I took care of my fear the night before I crossed the border. So if you are feeling fear, which we all will because change is coming, the first thing to do is identify specifically 
the fears that are going around you, okay? So write it down, write it down, write it down. And then once you have a handle on what that fear is, you may find yourself, when, you may when you get to the place that says my grief says, your grief might have actually a lot more to say than your fear, or your anger might have a lot more to say than your fear. Emotions really want to be heard by you. That's all. They have a higher purpose. Their purpose is that they allow you to co-create reality. They allow you to manipulate reality so that you can, and think about the reality that's being created on this planet through fear. Because some, okay, so, so this, is, this is what the ancestors told me this morning. Thank you. <laughs> they said the difference between people who can be empathetic and people who cannot be empathetic is that empathetic people cannot be manipulated. Their emotions cannot be harvested. Now think about that. If we don't understand how to keep our, our emotional body open and in compassion, we can be manipulated. Our emotions can be harvested and we can be manipulated. And if you look at the fear-mongering, I mean, I feel sometimes like I, for the last two years, like I've been hovering, watching, watching what's happening. And sometimes I do get sucked into fear and then I do my exercises and I go through all my tools because I know that that's part of the process, you know? It's an up and down and up and down. But when I'm up and I'm watching and I'm watching the polarities and I'm watching people fight about things that ultimately don't mean anything, and I'm watching people need to be right, and my heart just breaks because I think, we're all right. We're all just, when I was on a, the, there's a story in my book at the very end, when I was on a, a journey, I was on a um, vision quest, and I was on this journey. And at the very end of the journey, my guides were like, would you like to go talk to God? And I was like, yeah, I would love to. And so we get there, and I said to God, what do you think, what's ha what do you think about what's happening on the planet right now? And this was a while ago. I think it was during the, the first Iraqi war. Um, so things were kind of tense and, you know, everybody was very polarized about that too. And, and God said, you're all just stories I'm telling myself. You're all just stories I'm, and, and no, and I said, well, surely some of your stories must please you more than others. <laughs> and God said, all of my children's stories are sacred and all of my children's stories are equal. I was like, what? Are you trying to tell me that Mother Teresa and George Bush's stories are equal in your eyes? All of my children's stories are equal and all of my children's stories are sacred. And I started to argue again. And God said, the only question you should be asking yourself is do you love your story? Because if you don't love your story, you have no business in anybody else's story. Did I just get bitch slapped by God, I said? <laughs> God laughed, my guides laughed, I laughed, but it changed my life because I wasn't happy with my story. I didn't love my story. And when I didn't love my story, it was so easy to be angry at other people for their story. So that became the focus of my life from that moment on was to love my story. And because I know that I can co-create my reality, my focus has been to create a reality that brings me joy and brings me peace and allows me to be in service to other people. And it's why I'm a good therapist because I can move into empathy and I can spot immediately because I become that person. So I know your strengths. I know where you are beating yourself up. I know what's holding you back from stepping into your magnificence. And I can do it all with open heart and compassion. I wish I could say I was like that 24-7, but <laughs> this is why I have sessions with people, because only in that f frame of structure that I build can I do that for you know, my hour or my hour and a half or whatever. It, I'm working on being able to be like that all the time, but it, it is difficult 
to be empathetic all the time because you're open to everything. And sometimes it's very hard to feel what's going on in another person. You have to have compassion, but you also have to have really good boundaries. Does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? Okay, we've got a question back here. So you mentioned that you do a lot of writing when you're confronted with fear, and then you alluded to other tools that you employ. Can you talk about the other tools? Sure, thank you. What a good question. Um, <clears throat> I think this is in my book, too. Uh, so grief, crying, clearly crying. Fear, rocking on the floor. Or if you can't get down on the floor, sit on a bed or sit on a chair. But rocking, there's something about the motion of rocking that really soothes the body. And I think it's because as babies, you know, there was that when your mom was holding you and you were fussy, or even sometimes when you were feeding you, there was always a rocking motion going on, or even just being in the womb. So there's something in the neuro in the neurotransmitters of the body that is comforted by rocking. So fear. Uh, let's see, there was another thing about fear. Anger. We are hardwired to strike when we're angry. Hardwired. Why would your brain be hardwired to strike when you're angry? Can anybody answer that? I couldn't <laughs> until I really started to explore this. And what I understood is that anger governs the physical body. Anger is the emotion that governs the physical body. Anger comes when we are working in a victim reality and we have no power. That is the most, that's the biggest reason why anger comes in, is because we feel like we are powerless about something. And anger says, I don't have any power. True balanced anger, mature anger, is never angry. It's conviction. How many times have you ever had the experience of standing in your truth, even though somebody's like, you're wrong, that's not the way it's going to be, you have to do it my way, and you stand and you go, no, no, this is, my, uh, this is where I draw my line, right? Have you all had that experience of holding the line? That's what true anger feels like. That's what mature anger feels like. That's its purpose. Its purpose is to take you to that place where you're like, yep, this is where I'm standing, this is my truth, and nothing will push me off of this. I've had people get so angry at me because of that position. Because it, it you know, it, their shadow says that's what true anger looks like. I want that. And they're frustrated because they don't know how to get to that. I've had people say to me, I wish you would get attacked and hurt badly because you won't change your position about this. Like, yeah, I had somebody tell me that. I was like, luckily my anger protects me. <laughs> Anger's your warrior. It's the thing that keeps you safe, right? So we're hardwired to strike because physical striking transforms the emotion from angry anger to conviction. I have rage dolls that I use when I'm angry. And funny, I haven't done rage work for a really long time because I've because my anger and I are such good friends now, but oh my goodness, there were days when I would be screaming and shouting and hitting these dolls and yelling and screaming and then, you know, for two days and then all of a sudden I wake up in the middle of the night. The hours of anger are 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. and I would wake up at two and be like, ding, 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 ding. Oh my God, what? And I'd have this huge aha moment where I'd realize that the thing I was so angry about was my own co-creation and how I was giving my power away and how I was keeping myself powerless in the situation. And I was like, done and done. The next day I, and then not only does it give you that aha moment, it gives you some extra energy so you can take it to the next step and you can have that conversation with the person or you can set that boundary or whatever it is that you need, you get a little bit of extra energy to do that. So that's the tool for anger is, you know, punching, kicking, striking. Um, I, had a, I had a woman, a client who came in, she had a 13-year-old son, she said, 
boy, I really need some help. Uh, oh, oh, but prior to her coming for a session, my teacher came over for a lesson, and she's like, oh, I found this glass outside the dumpster at my apartment building, and I know you're always making art projects, so I brought it over. And it was like 10 panes of this really heavy, thick glass. I was like, what am I gonna do with that? But, okay, thank you, and we just piled it in the hallway and left it there. And then my client came that, that afternoon, and she said, my 13-year-old son, is really having trouble. He's being bullied at school. He's very upset. I don't know what to do. And he doesn't want to use the rage doll. He doesn't want to do any of the, he doesn't want to kick a box. He wants to break things. And I was like, ha ha! So she got the 10 pieces of glass and we set up a structure, you know, safety glasses, gloves. She took the glass home. He took it down the basement um, with a, I think he had a baseball or something hard, a cro croquet ball maybe. Um, and she, each glass became a person. And she said she could hear him and he, she was one of the pieces of glass that he put up. And bless her heart, she was perfectly fine with that because she understood the process. She'd been working with me for a while, so she understood it. And she said afterwards, he was changed forever. And he is a very successful comedian now. Yeah, and I, I just love, I love that story so much because it shows the wisdom of, of the children too that he knew beating up a rage doll wasn't the right thing for him. He needed to break something. And so when it was all broken, then he cleaned everything up, cleaned up the basement, and became a changed person. Um, joy, I guess we don't really need to... <laughs> I guess that question wouldn't really apply to joy, would it? You don't really need any tools for joy. Really, you just need to be open to it. But, um, pardon me? Okay, let, microphone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Ella, maybe you should sit in the middle. <laughs> That was one reason why I asked everybody to sit in the center was so that we could. Uh, the question is, so like the tool for joy, like, like when you have positive things, you, it's always like the, trying to grasp at straws. So what thing would you incorporate to hold on to something more beneficial longer? Oh boy, that's a deep question. Okay, so how much time have I got, Gary? Five minutes? <laughs> 10 minutes, okay, good. That's gonna be a 10 minute answer, I think. Okay, first of all, let's go back to positive and negative. Love this question. Thank you for that question. That's a good one. The, the question is, he said, in terms of joy, um, when you have a positive experience, what can you do to hang on to it longer? Am I paraphrasing correctly? Yeah, okay. What can you do to, to hang on to it longer? So first of all, let's talk about positive and negative. Positive and negative are two polarities of a battery. Your masculine side is, is positive, your feminine side is negative. Positive goes out and goes after things. Negative sits back and pulls it in. Now, how many people cut off the negative end of the battery before they bring it in their house? Nobody, because why? It wouldn't work, right? You can't have a battery that only has a positive side. You have to have a battery that has both. So the polarity of negative and positive work together. And the fact that we use negative as a word, as kind of a garbage can for anything we don't like, has, has really hurt our ability to manifest what brings us joy. Because that feminine energy is the energy of drawing to you with ease. The masculine loves us, like, give me a challenge, I'm going, run, 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 do, do, do. The, the feminine's like, ah. Let's just hang out here and let it come to us. And so the way those things are... <laughs> I can see that that resonated with somebody. So the way that that works is that the feminine, you dream about something, you visualize it, you fantasize about it, you let your feelings tell you what is the dream? What is it that's exciting? What is it that feeds you? And as you're thinking and talking and feeling it, the feminine is at work drawing it to you. And then when it gets close enough for you to get it, 
That's when you let your masculine go after it. How many people let their masculine run off way too quickly and it misses it? Man, my whole life. <laughs> Like, oh, if I just would have waited a little longer so it would have been a little bit closer and the dream would have been a little bit more developed, I would have got it. But I was too impatient. I can do this. I can do this by myself. I can do this. I got this. Okay, so that's polarity of negative and positive. So let's, um, let's um, change the way that we use the word negative and say, if you have some, if you say, I don't like to hang around with her because she's negative. Well, that's like, I don't want to hang around with her because she's feminine. Instead, you can say, I don't like to hang around with her because she's always complaining. Okay, see the difference? You're, spe you're being very specific and you're not lumping that into the word negative. So let's kind of take negative out of our vocabulary except as a wonderful word that describes our feminine energy of attraction. Okay, then the next thing about how do we hang on to those feelings of bliss or those experiences of joy. We all know that life is a sine wave, right? You get your ups, you get your downs. The further down you go, the further up you go. Everybody who's ever been labeled as um, bipolar understands this. The, the, that I remember I had a friend who, he, he had a very large up and down swing, let's just say. So he went to the, finally went to the doctor in his 40s. And they said, oh, you're bipolar, you need to be on this medication. They put him on this medication and a few months later, I ran into him, and I was like, how's it going? How's the medication? He's like, no, I went off. I said, why? He said, have you ever lived your life in the middle? It is so boring. I can't deal with it. I mean, his, he was one of those people that was incredibly interesting, never did things that was expected of him, and he had this incredibly interesting life that, yes, went up and down. And those of us who have chosen those kinds of lives, I've struggled with suicidal depression since I was 11 years old. That's part of my path, is that when I'm in those deep, dark places, there's something there for me to learn. There's, some, there's a gift there. If I'm not afraid of it, if I'm not fighting it, it took me a long time to learn how to do that, but now I understand that Joy is a direct, my ability to feel joy is a direct result of my ability to feel the hardest, most uncomfortable places within myself. And they go together. So the higher your highs, the lower your lows are going to be, and vice versa. The lower your lows, the higher your highs. And you're never going to stay here. And you're never going to stay here. It's always a journey. For many years, when I'd feel myself going like this, I'd be like, oh, no, I don't want to. And I would fight it, and I would be uncomfortable. But ultimately, if I, am, if I just let myself go there, and then kept notes, wrote, what's happening? What am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? Why did I do this? Why did I, how did I co-create this? How did I end up here? Why, why, why? Um, then I would get to the root of it, and then I would come back up. And now I can say that, you know, I live in this really great range. I, my lows and my highs are not, are not as drastic as they used to be, but there's so much more within this center part that I'm in because partly I have this ability to empathetically have many more lives than the one just that I'm living. Does that answer your question? Great. Any more questions? All right, at, when we do the closing ceremony after the offering, we're gonna do a little exercise in empathy. Um, it, it's the, the closing ceremony that I always do, and this time we can be open to uh, maybe feeling a little bit more into each other. But um, I think, Ah, one final thing. Three minutes, Gary? Okay. Let's talk about the good news. Let's talk about the really good news about what's happening right now. 
When I was in Mexico, I had a mir I just got back from a month in Mexico, and as I said, 2021 for me was a year of sort of pregnant pause. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was coming. I was really questioning myself. It's like, am I even needed here anymore? I've had a really good life. I've finished my book. I, you know, is it time for me to go? Like, why? You know, there doesn't seem to be any, I didn't have a dream. I didn't have anything that was making me passionate about life. And for me, if I don't have something that's pulling my passion forward, then I just sink into this. Um, it's not really depressed, but it's a depressive state. It's a state of waiting, right? And I'm not always comfortable with that. So then I went to Mexico for a month, and you know, I had a miracle. And that miracle brought about a small community of people that inspired my passion for what's coming next. And what they told me what they introduced me to was this, the Gene Keys. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with that. But it's, an, it's a whole body of work that's pretty amazing. And it has to do with the fact that our DNA has all this information about this process that we're going through right now, and that there's an ascension process that's happening on this planet, and our DNA is actually turning on different codons in our body depending on how we're feeling and thinking and believing. If we're in fear, those codons are not gonna turn on, right? You're gonna simply be replaying the same stories and the same experiences. But if you can move out of fear and move into empathy and move into compassion and move into trust, trust more than anything, to trust that the divine intelligence of your own body is taking us to a place that we can only begin to imagine. It is, even for me, who, who I have the ability to be so empathetic, for me to imagine the whole world harmoniously living together is a stretch. I have to really work at it. But spending time with these people and having these incredible conversations and realizing that my body, my beautiful temple that I walk around in has this incredible intelligence that's waking up and it's waking up with every single one of you. We're all waking up together. And as we're waking up, the world is going to change. And I truly think that the dialogue that's taking place right now to keep us in fear is to keep us from recognizing that we are on the brink of the most amazing evolution in history. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Kat. <clears throat> this was worth getting out of bed. <laughs> and so I'm glad that you were all able to uh, make it. So, um, Kat's been here um, before. Now, if you would like to join us next week, we've got um, at, at the 9 a.m. service, Don Leninger. Hi, Don. He will be leaving the 9 a.m. service, and at 10.30, there'll be uh, Cliff Cherrier. Now, Lake Heron Spiritual Community is funded solely by donations so that we can keep amazing speakers like this coming back and keep the lights open so that they can see their notes and things like that. So uh, ushers are going to be passing the basket. Give what you can. Deep, deep. Thank you. Imagine it. Overnight, all the water just evaporated. And as we slept, some divine trickster turned the globe upside down shook it like a, like a giant etch sketch and erased all previous national boundaries and then randomly doodled new ones.
a tradition and an expression of community, what we like to do is gather up in a circle around the sanctuary. I don't know that we'll have enough people to go around the whole sanctuary, so just the middle section. If we could gather up around the middle section. And then Cata lead us in the closing. Okay, we can hold hands for the minute, but then I'm gonna, so, and then s kind of stretch out a little bit. We can do it. Sure. All right, good job. Okay, now drop your hands. So we're gonna do a little energy thing. I know my hands are cold. All right, you're gonna put your left hand out and just leave it there, palm up. You're gonna take your right hand and you're gonna scan the person on your left, or the person on your right, you're gonna scan over their palm, and as soon as you'll feel when you hit that chakra, you'll feel it, right? Does, can you feel that? Woo! Okay, so normally what we do, energy comes in the body on the left and it moves out of the body on the right. So the feminine side is the left side, the receiving side. The masculine side is the right side, the giving side. Okay, so the energy comes in on the left, goes out the right, and it goes through your heart. As we go around the circle, it's gonna go through your heart. So what I'd like you to do is as, we close your, as you close your eyes and you start to feel the energy coming in, your left hand passing through your heart, moving through your right hand, allow yourself to open to the feeling of this entire group here and that you, we are all one. So you may get some impressions of other people's uh, emotional state at this moment. You may get some impressions of stories. You may get some recognitions, some sort of ahas. But just let's just do this for a couple of minutes and see what happens.
And now let's take the hands of the people on either side of us. And if you think of the globe and you think of all of us as a, a dot of light on that globe and you look at all the webs of connection, we are one small circle that's connecting into so many other circles right now. And we are all one and your story is just as interesting as anybody else's story. And your story is just as good and just as necessary as everybody else's story. So let's go forth and seek out those who have the most different stories than us and see if we can find that place of empathy. And let's drop our hands. Namaste. Namaste. You're welcome. Thank you. I do have books for sale. They're 20 bucks if anybody wants them. <laughs>